Hi everyone. Since the original goal of this channel was to help people who want to get into making armor by showing them how they can make suits of armor with basic tools, I figured today I would go through most of the tools that you will need to be following my tutorials. I'm going to be avoiding any kind of specialty tools such as stakes and jigs and um, dies and stuff. And I'm going to be avoiding anything that requires heat, so no forges or anything. Well, heat tinting still takes heat, so that's the exception. We want to have awesome peacock colored armor, we're going to need to heat tint that. So, I'm going to be avoiding any tools that are difficult to get a hold of. And I know this will kind of seem like a lot of stuff just to get started, but there's a good chance you already have a lot of these tools already. And while the cost of tools can be a bit of a barrier to entry, it's still nowhere near as expensive as paying to get a custom made tailored suit of full armor, which can easily cost over $10,000. And if you start making good stuff, you might be able to make the cost of the tools back by selling pieces to other people in your LARP or reenactment group. Alright, let's start with what is probably one of the hardest things to get a hold of. And that is an anvil-like object, or anything you can use sort of like an anvil. You don't need an actual anvil. Uh, it doesn't even have to be anvil shaped. Uh, the horn is useful sometimes and having that little transition there so that you can have it as a place to wedge stuff when you're hammering back towards your piece to roll an edge is useful. Sometimes. But all you really need is something with a flat surface and an edge at 90 degrees and on this one I have just rounded the edge a bit. This is just a 10 kilo hobby or craft anvil I got from a local hardware store. Um, probably the most expensive tool <laughs> of this list um, but if you can't find a hobby anvil or people call them anvil like objects because uh, this is only mild steel if all you can find is a big chunk of mild steel, maybe a piece of square bar that's two inch by two inch square bar, that will work if you can polish up the uh, top of it. You just also want to make sure that it doesn't bounce around a lot, so if there's a way you can anchor it down, that's really good too. Yeah, that's the first thing you're going to need. The next most difficult thing to source is going to be a lump of wood. <laughs> uh, for a dishing stump. Uh, essentially, you, you don't have to have an actual stump. A proper large stump is ideal because it doesn't bounce around when you uh, start dishing into it. And uh, if it's high enough off the ground, it's more ergonomic. But if you've got just a big lump of wood, you can just put that on a workbench that's stable enough. Personally, I have a die that I use. It's the same thing, it's just a depression, but this is a piece of steel held on a vise, and it's got a concavity. All you really need is just a concavity to hammer a piece of sheet metal down into. Uh, I use a steel one, it's easy to transport, but you don't need a steel one, a, most people just use ones made out of wood, they work fine. Another thing you'll need a piece of wood for is to cut a little groove into it for if you want to do any fluting on your armour. And another thing you're going to need to do fluting, or at least in the way that I'm going to be doing fluting, uh, there are other ways that require more complicated and harder to source tools, but for my Wait, for the method I'm using, uh, you're going to need a rounded off chisel. 
So this is just a cold chisel uh, and I've ground off the tips and I've just rounded the whole thing so it is extremely blunt because we don't want to be cutting into metal when we're fluting it. We just want to push it down into the channel we've cut into a piece of wood. But you'll also need hammers. Now this is another modified uh, tool. It's just a normal small ball peen hammer. This one's an 8 ounce head, whatever that is when you convert it into real units. Uh, but all I've done is I've rounded out the edge of the head because originally it comes, it's quite a sharp turn on it. And if you miss a blow with it, you will gouge little half moons into everything. But if you round off the edges of it, it's less of an issue. It's less likely to scar up your material. But the more important uh, modification is I've rounded off and flattened out the tip of that ball peen. So instead of coming to a more of a more of a point like most ball peens, this one's more rounded. This is so that it doesn't uh, compress the steel as much when you're dishing, but also when it comes time to rivet, because because it's a shallower curve to it. If you're off by a few mil, you're less likely to contact the piece you're working on and more likely to hit the top of the rivet. So you're less likely to deform around the rivet, putting ugly dents into it. And it's just easier to rivet with a ball pen that's been smoothed off like that. But this is the main hammer that we're going to be using for most of our working. Now, for deeper dishing, I still use the ball pen when I because when we dish something down into our stump, or in my case a die, uh, you make a few passes and it looks like a bag of marbles. And then you've got to go through the process of planishing it, which evens out all of those dents. And that is a very time consuming process. But you basically have to do that if you want deep dishing. But when you don't need deep dishing, the extra amount of deformation and compression on the steel, as along with the uh, marking of the surface that you get when using steel on steel, means that you have to do a lot more to get it looking nice in the finishing process, which can all be avoided by using one of these beauties. This is a panel beater's plastic hammer. It's weighted in the middle, and it's got hard plastic, Again, I smoothed out the edges of it a bit, uh, just with a file, so that they're less likely to uh, create a little half moon, but these don't really do it as much. Uh, essentially, this lets me dish surfaces without turning them into absolute bugs of marbles, and then the planishing stage becomes so much faster, it's like night and day. This will save you hours and hours of work and honestly I get a much better finish with just this than I can normally get with using steel hammers and planishing. This thing massively improves the finish on my armor and drastically cuts down on the amount of time I spend working on my armor. So if your armor keeps coming out looking like a bag of marbles and all lumpy and beaten up, and you're not using one of these, <laughs> you might understand why I absolutely love this tool. It, yeah, it, it really does improve the uh, final look of my armors, and is the main reason why I'm so easily able to get them to be quite smooth finished. What is absolutely essential, however, is one of these. At least one of these. This is, I forget the exact name, it's like a D clamp vice grip. This thing is a lifesaver. Uh, we're not going to be using heat. Well actually, 
I still use it when I'm holding on to the metal to uh, heat tint it, but that's not why this is a lifesaver. This helps protect your hands from developing carpal tunnel or armorer's or blacksmith's hand. Essentially, you need if you're holding on to a piece of steel and you're hammering on it, it's even worse with sheet metal and it's even worse again when it's co worked cold, the vibrations get transferred up your arm and if you're holding on to a piece of steel type your tendons are under tension and your muscles are under tension and if you jolt that yeah it's really bad for your joints it's really bad for your hands you end up getting cramps in your hands your hand just doesn't want to open and it's really painful and it is debilitating and while this does can't I'm not going to say this completely eliminates it, but um, back when I was a beginner, I started getting pretty bad pains, and when I discovered this, it occasionally I still have to stop. I get a bit too much vibration into the hands, and if you start getting sore hands from vibrations, stop. It's not worth it, but this is not in day because. Instead of the vibrations transferring straight into your hand, you can clamp this down on it really tight because it's a pair of vice grips. And you can go really tight and you won't worry about scratching up the surface like with a normal pair of vice grips which have teeth on it. They'll scratch up the surface of your steel. These are smooth. They're also good when you just want to crush two things together. It's a real time saving hack. Um, or just want to crush something down you can just squeeze it between these bad boys but instead of vibration going into your hand which is gripping the steel tightly and your hands under tension I don't really hold on to these so much as I make a loop with my fingers and it just stays in there so the vibrations first have to go into this heavy chunk of metal which dampens it but also I'm not gripping this tightly I'm just yeah my my hand is not under tension my joints and fingers and stuff aren't under tension because I'm not having a death grip on it so this can bounce around freely inside my hand and it saves my arm and my hand from taking all the shock and the vibrations you still get a little bit but it this little trick of clamping onto the steel with a pair of these vice special D-shaped vice grips and just letting it bounce oh the honestly it saves my hands I am in so much less pain using these that um honestly I consider these to be absolutely essential don't start work until you get yourself a pair of these now, you're going to also need a way to cut metal. Now, if you're just doing costume armor, you can probably get away with a pair of tin snips. These, they're basically scissors that cut thin sheet metal. But if you're going for thicker stuff, like 16 gauge, um, you're going to need something a bit more substantial. Uh, now, the big boy version of this is not essential. But I want to show it anyway because this thing is awesome. This cuts 16 gauge like it's paper. Oh, and there's a massive time saver. But this is not essential. But it's definitely an upgrade that is worth the money for when you need to cut relatively straight lines. You can do curved lines with this, it's not as great for it. But for a beginner, if you're cutting thicker material and you're only going to buy one tool, I reckon jigsaw is the way to go. If you're going to be cutting out stuff like 16 gauge, this is pretty much the way to go. Unless you can use a big pair of shears. And even though I do have the big shears, I do still use this a lot because it's great for tight corners and uh, inside curves that are difficult to do with the uh, shears. But yeah, just a jigsaw with the correct blades. I would 
definitely recommend against using angle grinders on the basis of it's really easy to mess up and wreck your piece of metal you're trying to cut out but also they're very dangerous especially if you start doing curves if you're trying to make a curved cut with a thin cutoff disc you're putting lateral tension on the disc and there's a really good chance of that thing exploding and flying everywhere but also angle grinders probably kill more people than any other power tool they are extremely dangerous like this is definitely the way to go quick note lubricate your bits when you're cutting steel it'll put less strain on the motor but also it will help save your uh, saw blades um, and extend the life of them so you're not wearing them out as quickly so the WD-40 goes a long way and the same goes with uh, when you're using a drill uh, yeah you only need a drill to make holes you could use a punch but eh, punch or a drill you, you probably already got one of these and if you don't there's a good chance you're going to need a drill at some point so you know, and it's a lot easier to change the size of the uh, drill bit than it is to go and source a new size punch uh, so yeah for holes for a beginner, and remember to always lubricate your bit. And once you've cut out the material, you're going to need a way to smooth off the edges. Because once you cut it out, you've got a sharp edge on your freshly cut piece of steel. The budget option is just a decent file. Uh, there are ones called magic cut files which advertise themselves as being the superior style of uh, file for working with metal but honestly I've not in my experience I can't say that I think they're worth the extra money so just a basic pair of normal files one with a rounded cross section is great so that you can do the inside curve of you know more fancier parts and as long as you keep these things from getting too gunked up they will uh, serve you well for ages but if you feel like splashing a bit of cash around I do really like my uh, electric file this is not essential you can do fine with just a file but this is great for saving time and I think it gives a really nice finish because it essentially just sands the edges so yeah, a bit of a neater finish. Uh, it's not as aggressive as the file. If I need to file out any um, uh, mistakes, I'll use the hand file still. But yeah, this is not essential, but if you want to throw a little bit of extra cash around and save yourself some time, this is the way to go. If you want to save yourself some money and a bit of spare time is not an issue, files are fine. Bolt cutters. You're going to want a pair of bolt cutters just for making rivets. Uh, you can just buy pre-made rivets, but I just buy nails of the appropriate size and shape. And, uh, ta-da, now I have a rivet. And to be honest, even if you do buy rivets, you're probably going to have to shorten the tang on them anyway. So you're going to want a pair of bolt cutters for, uh, you know, making your rivets. Oh, backing up a bit for, uh, drilling holes in your material you're going to want one of these punches uh, when you're doing articulations that are hinged articulations and the location of the rivet is really critical to it actually functioning as a piece of armor you don't want that drill bit wandering off and to be honest you don't want your drill bit wandering off when you're trying to drill through steel anyway it's a safety risk but you know again you can also if it drills in the wrong spot the, the, your piece might not work. So what are these? And you just hammer it to uh, put a little dent where you want the drill bit to drill the hole and it sinks it in and whoop, puts the hole right where you wanted it to go. So these, I, I consider this essential.
And with all of this talk of cutting and grinding and all of that stuff, we really should talk about PPE, uh, your protective equipment. If you're doing any kind of sanding or grinding, you're going to want some respiratory protection because you're sending up a fine dust of metal particles, which if you breathe in, they get stuck in your lungs. And it's pretty horrific when you see um, people who have been grinding professionally and they get a lung full of... Uh, metal filings. Alright, another thing you're going to definitely need is eye protection. When you're making rivets and stuff, the ends of the nail can go flying, but also when you're cutting stuff out, it's a real big deal. With a jigsaw for cutting out steel, when you're using a jig when you're using a jigsaw, you end up creating pretty much just a spray of really hot uh, little metal filings that if they get into your eye you will have a very bad day so when you're using a jigsaw you want wrap around safety goggles not just basic safety glasses um, so yeah this is definitely an essential piece of equipment along with your respirator and you'll want long sleeve cotton yeah, you know, work, um, work clothes, uh, not too baggy, don't want to corner anything, but you do want long sleeves, because again, those little bits of, uh, those little steel, uh, splinters flying everywhere, they are hot when they come off, so it, they can burn, so long sleeves. While we're on the subject of polishing, uh, that is the one thing that I still use an angle grinder for. I have an angle grinder with scotch brite wheels on it. I am going to upgrade to a bench mounted buffing wheel uh, just for safety more than anything. When I use a scotch brite disc I clamp whatever I'm working on down either using these or, or a pair of uh, C clamps but yeah, I bolt down or I clamp down whatever I'm going to be polishing and I pop, keep both hands on the angle grinder, make sure I don't have anything loose, don't have long hair. Yeah, I'm very, another reason why I'm very biased against angle grinders is because I almost got killed by one. I was doing some polishing with one, I had long hair, it fell down pulled the angle grinder into my face, almost got my throat, um, yeah, almost died that day, yeah, almost died that day, it was pretty horrific, but yeah, I know I'm biased against them, but still, they are extremely dangerous, they kill more people than any other power tool. Now, this isn't essential, but if you're going to be using scrap metal, and recycling scrap metal, you want something like a pair of calipers or whatever this thing's called. I think it's called a caliper. Yeah. Basically, you want something to help you measure the thickness of the material you're working with. Uh, if you're working with uh, store bought known thicknesses of steel, it's not an issue, but I do a lot of stuff with reclaimed and recycled materials, so it's good to have this, especially when you go to like a scrap yard or something and you can see how thick the piece of metal is um, but also when you're dealing with uh, scrap metal it's good to double check before you use it yesterday I almost started making a back plate using 2 mil thick um, <laughs> I don't need to have a 2 mil thick back plate if I'm gonna just have a 16 gauge breastplate <laughs> yeah so that would have been a waste of my harder to source material and uh, and it would have made it needlessly extra heavy so uh, yeah these are really good if you're dealing with uh, like recycled materials but if you're buying all of your stuff from a distributor and you know exactly how thick it is it's not an issue and there's lots of little things uh, screws and screwdrivers to hold stuff you're working on together so you can make it all, make sure it all fits each other before you attach it with rivets. Um, 
pens and rulers and stuff for marking stuff out and making templates and you know, all your scissors and stuff for working on templates and you know, with little fiddly bits and uh, you know, stuff for cutting leather, uh, including this. When I need to put a hole in leather for a rivet, I like to punch a hole in it as opposed to just driving a nail through because driving a nail through can create tears in the leather and then the leather is a little bit more likely to tear off so I like to have a nice clean cut uh, these are just paper hole punches, there are leather hole punches I've had decent success with these so yeah that's pretty much everything you're gonna need to get into making basic armor again I know it seems like a lot and it can be a bit of a you know, price barrier to entry but you know if you want to get into it that's what you got to do and this is a lot less expensive than the high-end specialty equipment which you might decide to migrate to eventually if you really love it and you know if you start making good stuff it once you get the tools and the skill it becomes a lot cheaper than buying it and if you're in part of a group you might be able to make your money back by you know, selling uh, bits of armor to other members of your LARP or reenactment group. But you know, if armoring is something you want to get into, you gotta have the tools. Alright everyone. See ya.